that was the official Communist Party strategy, and so, um, so they said they emancipated women by freeing them from the confines of the home and you know, putting them to work. Um, and then, uh, then with the onset of market reforms, those women were no longer needed in the workforce, and so they bore the brunt of all of the closures of state-owned enterprises. And so there is that parallel with World War II in the US. Um, well, the unemployment is rising in China. So male labor force participation is also decreasing, but not nearly as fast as female labor force participation. So the gap between, the gender gap in labor force participation is widening. So that's happening as uh, along with a steady decrease in female labor force participation. One, another, sexual harassment and sexual violence in general is a, probably the most important issue of the feminist movement. Another very important issue for them is gender discrimination in the workforce, in employment and in promotion. Um, there are so many companies, even though actually there are laws pro prohibiting employers from discriminating against women, it's routine for employers to just say, write out, or even advertise, oh, we only want men for these jobs. And that gender discrimination in hiring in particular has intensified just in the last couple of years according to, certainly anecdotally, um, but also according to some of the preliminary studies that have started to come out is that employers routinely ask women, are you married? When are you marrying? When are you having your first baby? When are you having your second baby? And so uh, employers don't want to pay for their maternity leave. Um, and so it's very difficult for women to get hired these days, and that gender discrimination is increasing by all accounts. Just going back to this People's Daily article, note the bizarre nature of this propaganda because not only is it trying to, it's trying to encourage educated women to have these young women or even students to have babies, but it says if they have babies, they have brighter job prospects which is just the most bizarre kind of propaganda. I can't really imagine that kind of propaganda anywhere else in the world. So that's also a testament to the communist legacy of high female employment rates, that it's just part of society now that women should be working. You know, it's not natural because of all the decades, the communist legacy where everybody worked, all women worked, it's natural for women to work. Now the party's trying to push a different uh, message, which is, well, no, women actually should just have babies and stay at home. But they're also trying to use the um, hold out the carrot of brighter job prospects because they say in this article, it's, really a fascinating article, they say that because of intense gender discrimination at, at employment fairs and employers are always asking you, have you had your first and second baby? That means that women who have had two babies are more likely to be hired, according to this propaganda. But whether that's true or not, I, I, you know, I'm very, I find that very hard to believe as well. But the point is that even in the propaganda, they're appealing to Chinese women's desire to work. Um, and so this is, this is a, another big reason why the feminist movement is, is such a threat to the party is because so many women agree with it. Women want to work. They want to advance in their careers or they want to pursue their education. They don't want to just marry and have babies.
are the universities in terms of encouraging clubs and things that might foster more participation in this movement? And do you think that the university system, with a large percentage of female attendees, is that how you see this movement growing so that it can be harder for the government to squash it? Well, um, the, well, one very important thing that you asked is of the university uh, enrollment of women, which has really increased. It's now record levels for women. But this, it's because there are record numbers of women with college degrees and master's degrees that there is this backlash from the government and from, it's, it's coming from above but now there are gender quotas for a lot of university programs when they're um, admitting students. This, was, this is another issue that the feminist activists took up, was um, uh, where is gender quotas, gender quotas for um, restricting the enrollment of women because there are a lot of university programs, and this is not uniform. These, these are individual programs different programs at different universities mm -hmm. that are very concerned that they don't have enough men enrolled, that they have too many qualified women, and that this is a huge problem. They've got to cap the number of women. And so they do that by, um, in the university entrance exam, like I'll call, and a lot of these programs will then require women to score higher than men for admission to the same program. And that was one big issue taken up by the feminist activists. And um, in 2012, they, one of their performance art actions was to sit in, in the middle of the street and shave off all their hair um, when, when one woman was denied admission and her, her male counterpart was accepted even though she scored higher than he did. And they actually wrote a letter to the Ministry of Education at the time, and they received a response then. And the response was, we are implementing these measures in the interest of national security. So, um, so the, then you get into the area of, well, government control of universities in general in China, which is tightening all of these ideological controls on university campuses are tightening quite severely in recent years. So gender, it started with gender studies itself has become much more tightly monitored and controlled. They never had a lot of resources to begin with and now they have fewer resources and much more surveillance. Um, the, I mean, just look at recently the fact that so many students on campus have been demonstrating, whether it's starting with Me Too, most recently in support of labor rights, and at the top universities in China, not just Peking University, there's the Renmin University, Nanjing University, just to name some of them, where they've been not, I mean, they actually beat up uh, at least one student on the campus of Peking University recently. So we're not, it's not just ideological control anymore. It's actual, um, you know, it's really out of control where these thugs come and they, they've actually attacked some students on campus. So it's, it's a really very serious problem. And then um, this is all in line with Xi Jinping several years ago coming out and saying that Universities have to be the stronghold of the Communist Party, and this we're molding future good um, citizens of China, and students have long been required to take these political Marxist-Leninist classes. Now they're you know, shutting down these Marxist societies because the students actually are Marxist. <laughs> God forbid. So they. Um, but with regard to just women, uh, the representation of women in university programs, that they're, they're now, because there are so many programs are capping university admissions for women. Um, right now, the, there are still, I believe, slightly more women enrolled in bachelor's programs than men. 
um, and and at the master's level, but then that drops precipitously at the PhD level. But I I certainly fear, and I'm I'm not just I think I'm quite right in fearing that we will see a lot more repression, um, a lot more um, incursions into in violations of women's rights in general. But at the same time, women want more. They're more courageous and they're standing up more. They found strength in numbers. So there more and more of them are refusing to back down. And this is where I derive hope in looking at the courage of young Chinese. And it's, there are men that are joining them as well. It's not just women standing up for themselves. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, uh, during the talk, it, it seems like you have a lot of hope, like you do have a lot of hope for the movement. Um, and so I was wondering if you feel that the government is more likely to, like it seems to me that um, like the smarter thing to do on the government's behalf would be to like, co-opt this mm -hmm. kind of piece. So, um, so she was asking, she said that, you know, rightly, yes, I am hopeful when I look at this women's rights movement, broadly speaking, and also how it overlaps with labor rights and LGBTQ rights, but it really focuses on these feminist activists and, and then women in, in general. Um, on the ground, I am not at all hopeful when I look at the Chinese government and what it is going to do to try to crush, well, I don't think it, it is going to try to crush the movement anymore because it's too big. Um, so another, what she asked was, well, do you think that the Communist Party will co-opt, try to co-opt the movement or co-opt these women? Um, yes. Absolutely, and we see signs of that already. Um, but they will not just try to co-opt them, they'll also, also continue to crush the most, continue to try to crush the most uh, prominent activists. So some of the accommodations the government has made um, include, in response to, the, in direct response to the Me Too movement, um, the Ministry of Education recently announced a new nationwide mechanism for dealing with accusations of sexual harassment at university campuses. They're going to take it much more seriously and they've, they've outlined a series of steps that universities are gonna to have to implement. Um, that's very concrete. They've also announced that they're working on a new civil code on sexual harassment which is a, effectively a law. That's gonna probably take a few years, I guess. But that's, those are clearly efforts to co-opt these women and tell the women, okay, you don't need to agitate so much because we're listening to your demands and we're making adaptations. Um, very interestingly, in recent months, the Beijing subway installed anti-sexual harassment signs, um, which is, precisely what the Feminist Five were jailed for uh, in 2015. So, and it's not just Beijing, there are a lot of cities that have started putting up anti-sexual harassment signs on subways. Um, so these are clearly attempts by the authorities to just show that they're responding to the women's demands. But at the same time, they're going to continue to repress um, activists, persecute activists, and I fear that on other levels, they will try to violate women's rights further, and particularly with regard to reproductive freedom. So for example, I could see individual provinces slowly introducing curbs on abortion. That would be a very logical thing, I think, for provinces to start doing. 
Um, but but again, there would be a lot of pushback. So you know, they, they may not succeed, but I think that that's what the government would like to do, is to restrict abortion now. Um, so we have time for maybe one or two Why is the movement so big? Are you asking, or why? Why is the government viewing it as a threat? Yeah. Why is the well, yeah. Well, that's a good question because the government is certainly being cracking down on civil society broadly. So it's certainly not just the feminist movement. Um, but there is something about the message of feminism that is directly contrary to what the party wants to do, which is assert patriarchal control. That that's so fundamental, I believe, to communist rule, to stability maintenance, to keeping troublemakers in line, um, that the very message of feminism itself is, is seen by the male-dominated party as being somewhat subversive. The very existence of feminist activists just with feminist beliefs is seen as subversive. But add to that the fact that these feminist activists are politically well-organized. They're very well-organized. And they have been for a few years, um, particularly uh, I would say just politically, it's become a more radical movement uh, after the jailing of the Feminist Five. It's become a real political movement, whereas it wasn't before. Um, and so, uh, so that, that as well is a threat. But at the same time, because feminism is spread to so many people, to so many women and even young men, um, who are calling for gender equality more, or calling out sexism, um, that it's just very hard for the government to figure out what to do. So, so that's why this, I think the women's rights movement poses such a complicated challenge. Whereas in the past with other dissidents um, or movements, the government was able to just jail the leaders jail the leaders or exile the leaders and then get rid of, neutralize the movement that way. Um, well, just, I mean, look at the Yosel Bor, the Nobel Peace Laureate. He was jailed and then he died in custody through medical neglect. And the vast majority of Chinese didn't really, they had barely even heard of him, let alone agreed with you know, what he was calling for. But it's very different because with women's rights, we're, they're talking about you know, just women's daily lives. This is not an abstract concept. They're not trying to overthrow the Communist Party. It's just women don't want to be sexually harassed, or they don't want to be raped. They don't want to be discriminated against. They want to be treated with dignity and equality. This is something that a l millions and millions of women can identify with, and so can men. And it's that broad-based appeal, broad popular appeal, combined with the organizational ability of the feminist activists at the core that poses such an incredible, complicated challenge to the party. Um, I think we've actually, we're, we're short on time, so let's, uh, let's Please join me in thanking Dr. Lee. The guests will be available in the hallway at 8. Uh, yes. That's right outside um, for a few minutes for.